All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. The doctoral student is working on designing their dissertation. The student wants to use a multi-element design and wants to use two graduate assistants to help with data collection and recording. The doctoral student's advisor, after hearing the plan, is skeptical about the graduate assistant's ability to measure what the doctoral student wants on a consistent basis. What is the advisor concerned with? So we have a situation where the advisor is giving feedback to a doctoral student. What does the doctoral student want to do? Well, they want to use graduate assistants to help take data on their multi-element design. Now, when the advisor says the concern is they can't consistently measure the data, what does that relate to? What term would we use for a lack of consistent measurability? A, internal validity, and B, external validity. Internal validity has to do with a functional relationship between our independent independent variable not necessarily what we're concerned with. We're concerned with measurement here. External validity is concerned with generality. Can you generalize your findings? Again, not related to the problem of consistent measurement. The issue is the advisor is concerned with reliability. Can these graduate assistants reliably take data? Accuracy has to do with measuring exactly what occurred. Maybe they will be accurate, but if they're not reliable, that's going to be a problem. Functional analysis reveals that a client's scratching behavior is maintained by the feeling of breaking skin. If you wanted to design an antecedent intervention for the behavior, what would be most appropriate? Whenever we're design designing interventions, we wanna to try to be function-based. Now, we don't know exactly what the function is, but we can get a good sense given the client scratching behavior is maintained by breaking skin. If the client is breaking skin, it's likely some sort of automatic or sensory function, right? Automatic and sensory are often used interchangeably. So if we want to design an antecedent intervention that is going to, let's say, prevent the feeling of breaking skin, how would we go about that? A, mandate your technicians wear long sleeve shirts and pants during service. This would be a great way to prevent breaking skin from happening. If we have long sleeve shirts on and pants, then there's a very good chance that the skin won't be broken. B, require your technicians to not provide escape if the client scratches them. Well, providing escape, one, will be a consequence, and two, it does not appear that this is maintained by escape. So B does not really fit. C, tell your technicians that they all they are to block all scratching attempts so that the client is not able to contact skin. Again, we're looking for an antecedent intervention. C is a consequence, right? It's reactive. D, implement an extinction-based program where attention is not provided for scratching. The functional analyses did not indicate attention was the maintaining function. Therefore, D is not going to be necessarily function-based. At the same time, extinction is a consequence. So the antecedent intervention here is A. Mandate your technicians wear long sleeve shirts and pants during service. A clinical director is tired of her employees always walking into her office and requesting raises or purchase requests. Now, when someone walks in the office, the clinical director points at her headphones, which leads to the person leaving her office. What is maintaining the director's behavior? Behavior question, whose behavior? The director's. Now, what is happening with the director's behavior? Is it increasing or decreasing? Well, she is pointing to her headphones and she does that every time. So at the least, the behavior is maintaining, meaning her behavior is being reinforced. Now let's look at the context of the director's behavior. When someone walks in the office, what happens? The director points at her headphones and the consequence is the person leaves the office. So she escapes the person or the person is removed from the environment, meaning this is negative reinforcement. So what is maintaining the director's behavior? A and B are both positive. Well, the person is leaving. So we can classify this as the director escaping, right? The, the raises and purchase request, 
or the person removing themselves from the office. Either way, it's a removal from the environment, making it negative. And since her behavior is maintaining, at least, if not increasing, it's being reinforced. So the maintaining of the director's behavior is C, negative reinforcement. A manager notices that employees are frequently arriving late to virtual team meetings. To address this issue, the manager decides to implement an intervention and writes a behavior goal that needs to be both observable and measurable. Which of the following definitions best meets this requirement? Now, let's be very careful here, right? We want to write a good behavior goal that is observable and measurable. Well, what are we trying to accomplish, right? What is the goal? Well, that manager is noticing his employees are arriving late. So we need to address the issue of arriving late in a way that is observable and measurable. So A, employees will show up on time to meetings at least 95% of the time. Okay, what does that mean to be on time, right? Employees will show up on time to meetings at least 95% of the time. It's not bad, but it is a little vague. Can we do better? Can we be both more observable and more measurable? B, employees will show commitment to the company by arriving to meetings early. Showing commitment to the company is not necessarily the goal. They want the employees to not arrive late not to necessarily get to meetings early to show commitment. And how do we measure commitment? How do we observe commitment? Can we do better than that? C, employees will show up to meetings no later than five minutes after the scheduled meeting start. Why is C better than A? A is not bad, right? Show up on time. Well, C is just more measurable. We can much better measure this precise no later than five minutes rather than no time period. Now, is it a little precise and a little specific? Yes, but that's just the point, right? We're practicing, we're working on it. We want to be as measurable and observable as possible. And then D, employees will participate at least three times per meeting for 90% of meetings attended. It's not a bad goal, but it is not our objective. It's not about participation. It's about arriving on time. So what is going to solve our issue and be observable and measurable is employees will show up to meetings no later than five minutes after the scheduled meeting start. Lewis is given a contract to sell a $10 million apartment. Lewis does a huge party, shows the apartment to several people, and gets an offer for $8.5 million. The seller tells Luis that offer is way too low and not at all what they want. Luis's, eff Luis's efforts so far are not adhering to what dimension? Got a dimension question. Let's be precise. What has Lewis failed to do, right? He's given us contract. He needs to sell the $10 million apartment. So he throws a huge party, shows it to people, gets an offer, but it's not good enough. So all of these efforts, all these things Luis, Luis is doing is not what? A, conceptually systematic. We don't know if he's being conceptually systematic or not. We don't have enough information to say yes or no. We do know that Luis is not effective because the seller says it's way too low that it's not what they want. Luis's, Luis's efforts are not effective. Generality. Has Luis generalized? It's unclear, right? What would Luis be generalizing in the first place? And then D, technological. Are Luis's plans technological? Can they be repeated? We're not quite sure. The only thing we know based on this information is Luis has not been effective. Norm is teaching his friends how to fish. Norm has his friends use different types of bait and rods. Norm will also bring different colored ice chests or life vests, even though these don't directly affect catching fish. Importantly, Norm makes sure to include the most frequently used bait and rods that his friends might experience. What is not included in this example? Now, we always say don't jump to the answer choices, right? Let's understand what is in the question. But this is one of the exceptions, because what is not included in this example? Now, what do they mean by that? So only in, in, in certain situations where we have to understand what do they mean, what the question is asking, should we go to the answer choice? And clearly what they're saying is, what generalization strategy is not included? So let's start with general case analysis. General case analysis involves an overall look at the environment. Now, Norm is teaching his friends how to fish, and he's using all these strategies, but nowhere in the 
question, does Norm actually conduct the case analyses, right? Because this is prior to implementation. Does he train multiple, multiple exemplars? Yeah, he does. They use different types of bait, different types of rods. He's training all these different stimuli. Is he programming common stimuli? He is, right? The most frequently used bait and rods. So exemplar training is multiple stimuli. Common stimuli is stimuli that fit into the environment. And then training loosely. Well, he buries the ice chest and life vest, even though they are not critical. That is training loosely. What is not included is the actual case analysis that may or may not have been done. Gavin, who is in cooking school, has provided a self-management plan that he has to follow over the summer while school is out. Gavin is required to bake or cook three times a week. Whenever Gavin makes a mistake during a recipe, he starts to repeat verbal affirmations to himself that he's learned while meditating. What is Gavin using? Probably the easiest self-management concept, right? Because it's just very obvious. What is Gavin doing? He's in cooking school. He's on a self-management plan. Got to cook three times a week. When he makes a mistake, he's talking to himself. What is that called? It's going to be self-talk, right? Self-talk is a way to prompt yourself through something. You can give yourself rules and instructions. That is self-talk as part of self-management. Self-monitoring is observing your own behavior and let's say taking data on your behavior. Self-evaluation is comparing your self-monitoring results to other results, either a certain criterion or a reference. And then self-control is self-management, right? It's that overarching idea of self-management. In this case, it's pretty clear Gavin is using self-talk. A behavior analyst is working with a five-year-old child who exhibits difficulties with social interactions and significant motor skill delays. The behavior intervention plan has successfully reduced problem behaviors and improved social interactions, but the child's motor skills remain far behind developmental milestones. What should a therapist do to best support the child's overall development? All right, we have a situation where the therapist, or in this case, the behavior analyst, is working with the five-year-old child who is exhibiting difficulties and the intervention plan has been successful. So all of that is fantastic. That's what we know so far. We also know the child's motor skills are far behind. So we have a situation where we've been effective, the analyst has been effective, except in the area of motor skills. What can the analyst or therapist do now to support that overall development? A, focus on the behavior plan and what is working in terms of behavior reduction and skill acquisition. Sure, that is very smart if you want to continue working on strengths, but the child is way behind in other areas. So how can we get that area up to speed? B, evaluate possible referral options to other service providers for motor development. Yes, referring out or offering referrals for issues that we can't handle or that maybe we're not competent in is a huge part of our job. Be that resource. C, modify the current plan to include motor skill targets, even though the analyst is not trained in this area. Well, if they're not trained and they're not competent and they're not qualified, they shouldn't be doing it. D, speak with the parents about spending more time at home on motor skill development outside of services. That may be effective, it may not be, but we've already had great success on all these other issues, except for motor skills. It might be time now to look at a referral and get this in the hands of someone else. Preston wants to try out what he believes is a better way to learn how to bake bread. Preston has a few different ideas of how he could incorporate his strategies, but it is important to Preston that he does not have to take baseline data in his experimental design. What would fit Preston's needs? Let's think specifically about what Preston wants to accomplish. The only thing we need to worry about is the idea that Preston does not want to take baseline. So what can we rule out? He doesn't want to take baseline. Well, the withdrawal design is out. The multiple baseline design, clearly out. The changing criterion design is out. That only leaves us with multi-element. If you can pinpoint these critical aspects of each question, questions become so much simpler. You're preparing for your first set of supervisees. Some are behavior technicians and some are students who are in ABA programs preparing to become behavior analysts. What should be the first thing you do after you've established supervision contracts 
with these supervisees. All right, so you're in a situation, you have supervision contracts in place, and they're your first set of supervisees. What do you do after you get supervision contracts? Do you A, develop a plan for what you want to teach and then role play? Do you model each teaching point? Do you establish goals for each supervisee? Or do you provide the supervisees an opportunity to write behavior plans? Well, just like with our clients, what is the first thing we want to do? We want to establish goals. Not until we know what we're going to target should we be developing plans and role-playing, because how can we role-play without a goal? How can you model teaching without knowing what you're trying to teach and accomplish? And then how can you let them write behavior plans if that's not a goal of what you're trying to do? So if you've already established supervision contracts, what you want to do at the very beginning is establish goals. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.